And secondly, you know, how do they combine if there are many? And many, many questions like this. Another example would be an obstacle problem when you have something like, a, um, I don't know, an obstacle of this shape. Um, imagine it as a, I don't know, as a blade in some sense, and you are uh, putting on it some tissue, some material, and the question is how is it going to drape? I mean, like, probably there will be some, something like this, I imagine. You see what I mean, right? There will be uh, some sort of surface of contact. It's not going to be along the entire boundary like this. You will not have a contact on the entire boundary. Yet the question is what's your surface of contact? That's another free boundary problem. And something here, 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 I imagine it will be a contact for this domain. But um, all of this sort of didn't go simultaneously in both directions. You would always be losing information, and that's understandable. I mean, um, the best uh, PD, the best reboundary results for a while were saying that if you have certain processes with, um, I don't know, at least Lipschitz coefficients, you have self on the boundary. And the best results in the opposite direction would go from Lipschitz domain to so alpha result inside, so you would be necessarily losing information. And part of the problem is um, the lack of the correct language to talk about those things because isolated singularities are always possible. So locally, sometimes things can go bad. So basically, um, the punchline of the story is that somewhere by the end of the 20th century, we started developing language which finally allowed to get to the equivalence of the properties. And this is, in some sense, what the lectures are about. So the, what the story is it? So somewhere I would say by uh, 90s, so end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st month. Um, people started working on the equivalence of uh, PD geometric and analytic properties of sets or setting up the language which would make it possible. Of PD analytic and geometric properties of sets. Um, so, and this is in some sense exactly what we are going to talk about. So, there is the PD component, there is the analysis component, and there is the geometric component. And there are connections between the three. And this is the point of the slide. Actress. Most important of all, the question is of developing the language which would possibly make this three sense equivalent, and I'm claiming that not even there yet, despite a lot of results which uh, made it better understood. And you know, hopefully, that's what you guys are going to bring us. Um, but before that happens, let me tell you what what we actually know, and this uh, this is the content of these lectures. So, in some sense. A lot is known at this point about, um, I would say that, you know, some, somewhere in the, in the end of the 20s, so something like 2018-ish, whatever that means, um, one could finally say that for domains with uh, n minus one dimensional boundaries, so for n minus one dimensional sets, in Iran. So more or less the first ones you would understand and then the size of harmonic measure since got understood. So we understand the harmonic measure. This is more or less as good as it gets in this particular setting. Um, and this is what the lectures were supposed to be about. But then since the pandemic happened and two more years have passed, by now, I mean, I would say that, you know, 2021, 20, 2022, 
uh, we started understanding the green function. And amazingly, uh, this will be the content sort of towards the end of the story. Amazingly, it's, it turns out to be, in my opinion, a better crisper, sort of topologically more precise characterization of sets. It turns out that despite the fact that green function and harmonic measure are very tightly connected, the green function actually contains slightly more information well, for the obvious reason that it's a solution inside. And so it has some information both at the boundary and a little bit off. Versus the harmonic measure talks much more on the boundary. So when you're losing connectivity to the boundary, when you have complex topological settings, when you have lower dimensional boundaries, it's a slightly better object. And this is the understanding to which we are coming now. This is literally, you know, probably most of these results are not. Uh, some of them are on archive, some of them are not even typed yet. So this is where we are coming right now. But most of it is, uh, so this is the n minus one dimensional boundaries and what's really um, very poorly understood, but sort of, I don't know, starting with 2017, but really with many open problems is lower dimensional, the sets with lower dimensional boundaries. And this is more um, the emphasis of this lecture than anything else, although as I promised, you know, it's sort of amazing. I mean, we really started working on the sets with lower dimensional boundaries, but then it forced us to go back and get a better understanding of the n minus one dimensional ones as well. So in the end, the story is very intertwined and there are many new results in a more classical setting as well. So what do I mean by lower dimensional? National boundaries. Well, according, you know, this is this thing is a lower dimensional boundary in R3. So anything like a chord in R3. Um, a DNA chain, and I'll be showing you many, many more examples, but uh, DNA chains uh, look pretty much like this. And um, you know, for the for the sake of the advertisement, let's use the buzzwords. There are a lot of things coming from the big data, which end up being the problems with lower dimensional boundaries. So, so we want that because basically the idea is that in this huge array of big data, there is typically very little of essential information. So you want to find and to classify and to understand those lower dimensional sets and be able to work with them in this enormous high dimensional array of data. And this is in particular why sort of this analysis, this geometry is important because you're really trying to understand the regularity the, um, and you know, analytically be able to work with very low dimensional sets in very high dimensional data. And I'll keep referring to it as we will be going so. But my point is that you shouldn't be necessarily on the same, you know, uh, dimension one sets in a three, even though visually it's uh, sort of the most uh, the easiest to understand. Um, it's really typically more important in this in today's world, very low dimensional sets and very high dimensional world, something like that. So DNA chains, big data, all of that. Yeah. Are you only thinking about dimension in terms of password dimension or also topological dimension? Good question. I'm personally just thinking about password because I don't know about it. But um, I think that, yeah, we will have to talk about topological dimension once we get to that. So, yeah, I, uh, to me, I mean, we, we didn't understand, you know, how's that one that well yet. Neither an analytic movie did to us. But, uh, yeah, one day more generally. Any other questions before we go in? So this is more or less, you know, the um, the, the level of things we are going to be discussing. Uh, we will see how far we get in the story. I promise to, I mean, just one little portion. I will definitely not give you all the references as I'm going through. I'll try to be much more precise on the materials which we will post online. So apologies if I'm I'm missing, I'm missing anybody's important program, please keep going. Okay, 
You sure? No other question? So a little bit about the um, structure of the, of the lectures. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to work out technologically. So we'll have to sort of um, adjust as the thing starts. I'll start from the slides just because I want to show you some pictures and I don't want to draw them. But then I'll slowly move to either just writing on the iPad or the platform. So, you know, keeping um, all the digital materials, if you need them, I can keep them and I probably should. So, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll, send, uh, I'll send the slides to Sasha so if you want to write on the slides from next time. Directly you can, but yeah, let me know. Okay, now I'm going behind the page if there are no other questions. And uh, let's discuss the geometric setting a little bit. So the, the first one will probably be what you know, what all of you know, but we all need to wake up. So let's wake up slowly. And uh, first of all, yeah, to follow on Matt's question, <laughs> what is the dimension of this set? How about the dimension? Um, in the first one, stolen from Tatiana's slides, for those who know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I didn't really try to send them on the slides. Um, you can more or less obviously see, you know, a sort of contour of a one-dimensional post-scription graph domain. The one on the right hand side looks like a ball, is a ball. So <laughs> this is what you're saying is this. With this one, unless you have seen it, it's not so super trivial to say. But um it turns out that she's a, you know, what you're saying, it's a two-dimensional surface. It's even better than that. It's so called like Marco. We'll get to what this actually means, even though I secretly hope you know. And with this one, I don't even know what's <laughs> <laughs> Probably if I actually read the paper that I stole it from, I would I would know. But for your reference, actually, I mean the uh these two ones uh actually come from um, a tiny uh, note and notices of the mass or and I think it's super cute and that you know again what I'm talking about I advise you to read it if anything to give it to your students if you're not a student <laughs> yes, um I'm guessing that I mean it's not awesome I'm guessing it's an program because it's authored by mysterious word editors. And looking at the list of editors, I can identify only one who could possibly produce it. Um, but I think it's a very sort of nice, you know, sort of way of introduction to the concept of rectifiability. Anyway, what is the dimension of the sets? Well, let's recall what this Hausdorff dimension is in. So, first of all, you are defining the Hausdorff measure which has a two parameters to it, well, one actually, S. And uh, the Hausdorff measure is, of course, uh, in film of some of the diameters to the power S of the sets on which you form the cover. So you have some parameter delta to start with. You are going to make it small very soon, small delta. You are covering the sets of diameter at both delta should get something good. Uh, actually this works right uh this works so you are covering the sets of diameter at most delta honestly you should think of balls i mean balls don't give an equivalent definition but they give an equivalent definition of what dimension is they don't give you a completely equivalent measure so think of covering those balls as you see on this picture uh by the balls of diameter at most delta and then you are summing up the diameter of balls to the power s, and then you see what happens. And what happens, and this is slightly surprising if you really have never seen it before, although again, I hope you did, is that there is only one s that works, meaning for s, the government. <laughs> So for us above a surface national, we will always get zero. For us below a surface national, we will always get infinity. And then there is only one S 
or we should have got something meaningful, and that S is very much. So just for idiotic, you know, again, morning kind of calculation, you take a square, let's say in you know two dimensional square, you ask yourself how many poles of uh, size delta I can cover at least. Let's say it's one by one square. Very easy. So you take delta equal to one over n, you cover with roughly speaking n squared poles, of course. Times something of size uh, one over n. So it means that your uh, S delta would be, uh, so I'm calculating this. So it's one over n power delta times n squared, which is n to the power delta minus two, two minus delta. Yes, yes. n to the power two minus delta. And then you ask yourself, let me remind you, delta is one over n, you're sending it to zero. So you're sending n to infinity. For now, I need to make an effort. So for delta smaller than, this is s actually, not delta, right? S, s. Um, two minus s, and this is s, apologies. So for us below two, you will always get infinity. For us above two, you always have zero. And exactly for two is when you have a meaningful answer of the story. And so the dimension of the one by one square. But this is, you know, basically the, it, it looks like a very idiotic example, but it's basically what it takes. Um, any questions about the example? No, not so far, okay. And then for more complicated uh, situations, quite honestly, the easiest thing to do, at least when the sets are self-similar, is to use the scaling, which is this property. This you can get from just the definitions. And so you know that the Hausdorff um, measure corresponding to S is lambda power S H S. And basically from this scale, and typically for self-similar set, you can pretend to be a physicist and pretend that whatever you have gotten from this computation is actually correct. So let's pretend for a second and I'll uh, give you, so this is how, basically how we compute the trust right now with the square. Um, similarly, you basically say that, um, so what, what this formula actually says, it says that if you have, uh, taking, I don't know, one half of your set, if you have decreased, you know, if you have decreased the linear scale by a factor of two, you should increase the number of balls, you know, the number of pieces by the factor of two powers. So this is more or less, so the, the correct dimension is that if you, you know, decrease the linear scale, I don't know, or whatever it is, you increase the number of pieces by two powers, something like that. So an example would be, um, can I operate this thing without breaking? Uh, let's try it. So if you take a sigma, for example, it's one dimensional. If I decrease the linear scale by two, if I consider them twice smaller, then I get two power one pieces, uh, pieces, and this is my S. Similarly, you know, if I take a square, I break into linear scale two times smaller. So linear scale two times smaller, and I get two power two pieces, right? Um, if if I go now to things like snowflakes, for example, if I go to more complicated class. So one example is the Fulton-Cox snowflake. You get basically four pieces out of every time you decrease by three. So what I do is I take, um, for example, this one, and put it into three, and I increase the price. 
So basically the point is that every time I decrease by three, decrease linear scale by three, three times, I get four pieces. And this is where the dimension is coming from. So this is why which is log four over three. So that would be uh, three power s this point. And so on and so forth. Uh, now this is super useful, you know, sort of way computation. Of course, it doesn't give you the actual mathematics of it. And for the actual mathematics of it, you have to do things which are slightly more um, complicated. But before we get there, um, let's consider one example which will sort of be prevalent throughout the discussion. And one concept which is going to be prevalent through the discussion is uh, GL force David regularity. So, what this means, and actually what we will be chasing throughout the conversation, are things which are scale and variance, and which are the same at all scales. In dear force David regular, I really don't like the word regular in my but it was invented about 100 years before me, so I don't get the say. But um, dear force David regular basically means three dimensional at all scales. So, there is absolutely nothing regular about this, as a matter of fact. It runs d dimensional at all scales. And, you know, if you ask me on the spot what's not dear for the I, I so I'm sort of trying to give out, for example, so everything here so that we have some freedom. But what's not dear for the regular is one dimensional here and two dimensional there. You know, like if you take a ball and you attach, well, handle kind of to the two dimensional and you attach a spike. Yeah. So this is a counter example. This is not ADR. So ADR just means that it's, you know, it keeps being one dimensional for scales. And one example of something which is not super regular, but nonetheless, ADR, specifically one ADR is this so called four corner counter set, which will be sort of a late motif of many of our counter examples. So you take a square, you chop it uh, linearly into one quarter. So this is important to get your demand. So you chop it into four pieces, place them in the corners. You continue this process. You chop it into four pieces, place them in the corners, and so on and so forth. First of all, you get a one-dimensional set, at least counting as a physicist, because every time you have uh, you chop them before, you got one quarter size, four times one fourth as well. They keep going this way. And uh, secondly, it's actually uh, uh, one ADR because everything happens exactly the same way. Uh, with that, I didn't even give you the definition. So, I'll force David regularity is, of course, the fact that the uh, Hausdorff measure corresponding to a certain dimension D of any ball intersected with your set E centered on the set, of any ball centered on the set, is roughly speaking up our P with powers from the ball. So what this uh, weekly thing means is always that there are constants bounding from above and below. Meaning that HD is bounded from below by C minus one R power D and from above C R power D and that this is uniform and R. Um, so one thing that I do want to show you though, because I think it's important, it's cute, is uh, how to do it appropriately. Um, or at least half appropriately, uh, to prove that the Kenter set has actually dimension one. And this is going to be important for something that comes uh, soon. So this alert physicist calculation that I have given you gives actually a power from above. Because what I basically said is that um, if you cover with, you know, every time, every iteration, every iteration oops, um, of the set. So we are counting still Garnett for corner counter set. So every, every iteration, let's say case, has uh, four to the power K pieces, you know, squares of uh, linear size of, of diameter, roughly speaking, four to the power minus K, right? So 
just in my definitions, remember this definition with the covering. I can cover with balls of radius um, two to square root of two times uh, four to the power minus k, right? If I have a square root size of the of diameter four to minus k, I can cover it with a ball of size square root of two to minus k. And so it will be uniformly give me, you know, h1 um, delta and hence, you know, h1, which is going to be bounded from above by square root of two. Just because I have four to the power k of balls of size four to the minus k square root. So this is to show you that a lattice's computation actually gives you the upper bound, not all of it. And uh, with the lower bound for the Cantor set, what you actually can use is uh, the projections and claim that you know projection never increases, which also requires a proof, but I will not do it. So projection for lower bound, you use the fact that projection doesn't increase linear size, does not increase size. And you're going to do a projection on, uh, let's see if I can draw it. So let's do the projection on this line. This line, almost. Okay, I'm doing an orthogonal projection. It's supposed to go through both corners. And it's not a perfect drawing, but you get what I mean. And what happens in this uh, is if you do it honestly, which I'm only managing, uh, let's do this way like this and then i'm uh, projecting this ball as well right this square and then i'm projecting this one uh no uh, yes almost sorry <clears throat> i'm gonna get better if i get less shot like i promise like that and like that and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that absolutely miraculous that it kind of projects completely on the slide without holes. Meaning that you always have, and this is going to be the same in iterations. If you think about it, your projection on this particular line is actually a good piece of the line. You know, it's 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 a segment that doesn't have any holes. It goes all the way from here to here, and because of this fact, it's going to be the same in iteration. Because the next iteration, you're going to project four corners from here, but by the same token, they're going to give you the entire piece over here, and same for the other box, and same for the other box. So this gives you the lower bound. And even though I'm too lazy to compute what this actually is. From here to here, it's definitely bigger than one. So one is, we'll say that h1 lower bound is one. Um, does anybody remember by any chance what the h1 of Cantor So square root of two is actually, yeah, that's the other. Yeah, that's the other. He was telling me this in the morning. I'm like, oh, is it really square root of two? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really square root of two. Okay, square root of two is it. <laughs> You guys win by majority. Um, okay, so square root of two is it. But anyway, so this is sort of miraculous and you will see soon why. Um, let's get, uh, let's talk about the uh, smoothness of sense a little bit and then we'll move on. So basically what I told you in this graph story is that, um, you know, we went from smooth sets to balls and half plate to um, grab the mains, first of, all, first of all, of course, to smooth grab the mains, in which case, you know, change of variables is already pretty good. Then to Lipschitz functions, and, uh, you know, I'm probably not that older than most of you are, but I still remember moments in my own papers when we were writing that Lipschitz is the worst that it can possibly be. You know, like my thesis started with the words that the first possible domain is Lipschitz domain. Well, it's not, as we know right now, but there were times. And the Lipschitz functions are, of course, the well satisfying that condition over there, but basically, you are allowed to cut corners. 
In principle, you are allowed to have infinite domain corners, but they are supposed to be corners of a certain size. So cones go, corners go. What doesn't work is making them tiny, you know, infinitely tiny. So this is Lipschitz, and if you add to this something like this, it's still going to be Lipschitz. But what you are not allowed to be agent for them are things which actually become, you know, more and more um, sparse. So this and so on would not be Lipschitz. You know, if you keep making the angles smaller and smaller, that's bad. Not uniform, at least. Not Lipschitz in the sense that we want it to be. Um, now, it's true that, you know, despite the fact I'm saying that's not the first one anymore, it's true that in terms of smoothness, this is not bad that it gets. You know, typically cusps you cannot get all that much. But in terms of structure, it's not. And the very important notion, which actually already surfaced almost 100 years ago, but wasn't used that much, um, or quantitatively wasn't used that much until recently, is rectifiability. And rectifiability says that the set is not just one Lipschitz graph, not five Lipschitz graphs, but kind of like many Lipschitz graphs. How bad can it be? Well, it can be pretty bad. This is rectifiable. Countably many is actually a lot. You know, you can really get into, you know, bits and pieces. So all it means is that locally you are sort of bearable. But locally and not uniformly and not at all scales and then any scale you might have out of the many pieces so you will not even be able to see that you're there. One very important feature of the rectifiable sets which we will um, keep talking about because it, it sort of guides the um, PD intuition is the so-called approximate tensions. Of course, Lipschitz domain is the one which has tensions almost everywhere, and this is the owners to owners tensions. You can have corners, but you can have only corners at almost every point for the every point. Well, which the corners are sort of obvious, but you got the point. So Lipschitz graph is the one which has tensions, owners to owners tensions almost everywhere. Rectifiable set is the one which has so-called approximate tensions almost everywhere. And I will not go because I'm, I will not explicitly use this notion. So I will not give you an appropriate definition, almost. I will give some sort of definition. But I do want you to keep thinking about this. So this is not, I mean, this set is rectifiable and it contains this blah, 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 blah. And uh, this things and this holes. All of these are parts of the set. So in principle, this line is not that tension in the you know, normal human calculus sense. But it is an approximate tension. So what approximate tension means is not really a concept of tension as much as it is a concept of approximating line at every scale. And this becomes really um, vivid when we speak about um, things which are more quantifiable. But before getting to that, let me show you one result which to me is still surprising many years after I have learned that um, so there are sets which are rectifiable, which is the ones that we can show. There are sets which are so-called purely unrectifiable, which is the opposite end. It means that um, the Hausdorff dimension of your set intersected with any rectifiable one is zero. So it doesn't contain any piece of any rectifiable set ever, of any Lipschitz graph, of any sonal. So purely unrectifiable means really, really bad. It doesn't have a rectifiable. And it turns out that there is nothing else. Like any set in the world can be written as a um, sum of two, as a union of two, one rectifiable and one pure rectifiable. There is nothing else. It, it's sort of completely magical. I mean, as uh, to me, you know, on one hand, I'm saying yes, rectifiable sets are difficult and painful, and they are. On the other hand, you can imagine much more difficult and painful than. Than that, right? And it turns out that not really, in the sense that you know, all that other difficult and painful is supposed to have out of dimension zero when intersected with rectifiable one. So any set in the world, and these are very deep geometric measure theory results. Um, in R2 due to Bizikovich and uh, hard dimensions due to Federer. And if you really want to read Federer's book. 
<laughs> Lone Musk and Fred, yes. But you know, it's also a relief that whatever you read after about Kashmir, it's not good. <laughs> anyway, you, you are supposed to sustain some things in life, so things look good after all. Um, but anyway, so it's a deep and difficult theorem, but any set can be written as a, any set of uh, you know, how the D can be written as um, a union attractive public, purely attractive public. Now, what's purely attractive part or what possibly can be that bad that intersected with any electric graph that gives you nothing, intersected with any electric part of that gives you nothing? But it's by now our friend, the work on our cancer set. And here is a fun way to prove it, also not, not trivial because I'm not going to give you the pieces of it. But it turns out that one feature of purely attractive sets is that they are the ones whose projection on almost every line is not is zero as hard as dimension zero so they are not visible and now you will tell me wait you have used five seconds ago a projection on the line to show that it has full measure one well i was very smart choosing the line so i wouldn't have was before me and you how to do it Actually, that's not the one I chose the line myself. I remember that there is one line that I can actually figure out which one I chose. So. But I bet I've seen it before in life. Um, but anyway, so if you choose the point is that the projection that you have seen before is basically one of the few that can possibly go. Of course, there are symmetries in the set, so it's not the only one. But any other projection you could possibly use would actually fail. So by in any other direction, the set is invisible, and that's why it's purely unrectified. So purely unrectified will make some visible here project. And again, any any other one can be written as a union of two. Okay. And finally, the thing which we are actually going to work with, and what honestly gave a chance to this entire set to exist. So when I was talking here about the fact that you need appropriate language. This is the appropriate language, not just the concept of rectifiability. And that's probably the reason why it wasn't available until the end of the 20th century, is uniform rectifiability. You need things which are quantitative in order to do PDEs, in order to mostly, most of the time. You need things which are quantitative, and uniform rectifiability is a quantitative notion of rectifiability. Much as I told you, you know, like HD, ADR, for the regular means t dimensional at all scales, uniform rectifiability means rectifiable at all scales with the control of constant. So, what it means is that not only you are a countable union of Lipschitz graphs, it means that um, the Lipschitz constants are controlled and the intersection is controlled. So, for every rectifiable set, is the one for which, given any point on the set x and given any scale r ball of size r, you have um, some Lipschitz graph, Lipschitz image actually, to be completely honest, which supports 1% of your set, let's say. So notice that it misses substantial pieces. It misses, you know, everything which is here. This is all missed. And even pieces of this is missed. But in all ball, for every ball, there is a Lipschitz image which intersects your um, set to 1% and the Lipschitz constant of this Lipschitz image is controlled as well. So there, is a, there are two pieces of uniformity here. There is one per set of intersection and one is completely fake, it could be half, but it has to be the same at all scales for all x for all y. And um, the Lipschitz constant is something that's controlled as well. So you cannot, you are not allowed to have this tiny, tiny piece or sharp piece, or for the electric graphs. So everything is uniform. And again, it's still, um, you know, it's, it's something which is actually difficult to, to imagine to be good, and it's not, but it turns out to be. So it means that you have uniform control at all scales, and even if it's control of one percent of your set, it still, as you can see, gives you a lot of information. So this is the appropriate quantitative one example of what rectifiable and not you are, 
I, I didn't know, you know, how that beautiful red picture was actually created, so I don't know if it's your or not. Since I'm not the one who has drawn this, I have no clue if it's uniformly rectifiable or not. Probably she's actually given at the, uh, given the picture, but one thing which is rectifiable and not your and funny enough rectifiable, is uh, the contraction that you can get by getting the four corner counter set. And then instead of uh, retaining the full squares, is actually retaining the boundaries of the squares. So you do the same construction, um, but instead of you know you're instead of speaking of the full square, you are just retaining the boundaries. It's a computation, but you can make it that you still get a one-dimensional set, even though you're even though you're doing sort of less in um, in iterations, but you get the one-dimensional set. Um, you keep the corners. So the difference with the previous one is that instead of replacing all four, you are only replacing three out of four. So the upper corner always remains bigger. The upper corner remains. And as a result, you know, in the limit, you are going to get something which is still made of these pieces of, you know, straight lines. Hence, you have rectifiability because it is a union of different graphs. It's actually a union of straight lines plus dust, but it is a union of straight lines. So it is rectifiable, but it's not uniformly rectifiable because none of the, you know, you don't preserve uniformity. In any poll, you will have smaller and smaller pieces of reality and plus dust, plus dust, plus dust. So it takes a little bit of, you know, thinking and computation, but this is one example of something which is rectifiable and not uniformly rectifiable. Again, let me remind you that the original four on a kind of set is neither. It's actually purely unrectifiable. But that's because I rotate you, I peeled all four. And here I'm actually retaining the corner. And I keep it being there. Um, keep it being there. Um, sort of giving me you know, enough need to play rectifiability. And I actually have forgotten this example at some point, since the poll for a moment. I don't know what it's called, but yeah. That's why you have graduate students. You know, I remember since that you don't. Um, so yeah, thanks for reminding me about this. Okay, so that's uh, 10 50. Let's probably take a break from here and we'll reconvene and can you is that the video? Yeah, so look up 10 minutes for questions. And coffee. <laughs> no, no, look up 10 minutes for questions and 15 minutes for coffee. <laughs> no, I, I still have some of my left, so you know, like I'll have cold cold with questions. Here are the questions. Yeah, that's not great. I have one little announcement. So, theoretically, coffee and food in the food is not allowed. So, you're perfectly welcome to bring it, but it's a secret there. <laughs> And try to not feel. Yeah, you can fall asleep and feel it on the floor. Yeah. But that's kind of great. Okay. See you. So the, the next one is 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I realize that it was extra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.